A word from our sponsors. Hattie Group has been partnering with top ad tech companies to fill their most important roles for over a decade. Their expertise lies in placing the best candidates, ensuring you efficiently and effectively build your strongest team. Imagine having a team that's not only skilled, but also perfectly aligned with your company's culture and goals. Hattie Group understands the unique challenges of the ad tech industry and are dedicated to helping you focus on what matters most, your technology and your clients. Their rigorous recruitment process ensures you get top tier talent, allowing you to stay ahead of your competition. To learn more, visit them at hattygroup.com. That's H-A-T-T-Y-G-R-O-U-P.com. This is a disclosure. Please note that all guests featured on the AdTech God Pod are invited to participate. They do not pay in any form to appear on the show. However, guests may be sponsors of the AdTech God community, the AdTech Forum, or other product offerings. Welcome to the AdTech God Pod, your window into the world of advertising technology and the people behind it. I'm your host, AdTech God. Welcome back to another episode of the AdTech God Pod, the podcast where we meet the female leaders of our industry. I'm your host, AdTech God. Our guest today is none other than Nicole R. Ferreira, a true trailblazer in the media industry. Nicole's currently the owner of NRF Media, where she's leading the change in innovative media solutions and strategic growth. But Nicole's impressive journey doesn't stop there. Before starting NRF Media, Nicole served as the head of product and ad sales marketing at Inmar Intelligence. There, she played a pivotal role in driving product innovation and marketing strategies that revolutionized ad sales. Nicole was also the head of platform partnerships and emerging media revenue at Paramount. She wasn't always on the publisher and advisory side, having previously worked at some of the biggest agencies in the U.S., including her time as group director at Omnicom, where her leadership and vision were instrumental in shaping successful campaigns and driving substantial growth for a diverse range of clients. With such a wealth of experience and a knack for staying ahead of the industry, Nicole Ferreira is here to share her insights, experiences, and the lessons she's learned along the way. Nicole, welcome to the AdTech God Pod. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to have you, and I'm super excited to meet you today. So I, I know your background is, is pretty diverse. You, you've obviously gone from you know, agency side into publisher and now into in, more of an advisory role, but can you just give the audience uh, some insight into your journey and, and how you got into ad tech? Absolutely. It also is quite around the circle. So my first job out of college was working at a company called NCM. It's called National Cinemedia, which most of us know as the ads before the movies. And I had a mentor there named Cliff Marks, who had worked in many jobs prior. And he sat me down one day and we had a conversation and I asked him how he got to where he was in the industry, how he had become the head of sales of National Sin Media. And he told me that working in advertising in a media agency was essentially the grad school of all marketing and advertising. So I decided at that point, that was what I was going to do. I was going to go work at a media agency and go to the grad school of, of advertising. So I started interviewing at digital agencies and <laughs> I had an interview at this small full service digital agency. My final round interview was with the owner of the agency. He sat me down and asked me the most ridiculous question for a marketing assistant at a ads before a movie company. He asked me how the ads were placed on the movie screens. He asked me if it was an analog movie and the ad was digital, how it worked. He asked me if there were different ratio sizes for the ads versus the movie, how that worked. And I sat there horrified because I didn't know the answers. I went back to the office at NCM and I got every single answer. But in order to do that, I learned all about yield, trafficking, all the things a marketing assistant has no idea about. So I learned every in and out of the technicalities of ad serving. And I got the job of being a digital media buyer. That's essentially how I learned about 
what we now call ad tech. And I've been a geek ever since. What do you feel like was, was the hardest part of all that was like, how do you even research and teach yourself that? I mean, I'm assuming this is not like today where we're today, we have a bunch of resources available for training, but how did you even bring yourself up to speed on trafficking and campaign management? The hardest and the best part of that, that I learned was a company has so many people and so many interlocking groups that when you work in one department, you don't see every day. So when you're a marketing assistant for an ad sales group in New York, which I was at the time, there's a headquarters and a group in a completely different office, maybe, that you have no idea about that you're not working with every day. So what I learned from that experience and have taken throughout my entire career is, you know, how to work cross-functionally and how to seek out information and learn and keep learning and keep meeting people from different departments and learning what they do and how they do it. And it could be learning what someone in a different department does or what someone in a different company does working in collaboration with your company. So I think it's just constantly learning from other people that I learned in that one instance that has helped me throughout my career. Because as we all know, this industry changes every day. So you have to constantly learn and you have to constantly learn from other people. Yeah, I feel like the probably one of the strongest resources is is the people around you, um, coworkers and colleagues. A big source for me has now turned into obviously like reading the trades. I think that's really important. But, you know, for me, X has been really important. I've learned a lot from, you know, following so many influential, smart people there who who just seem to give their opinions and, and their views of so many different things that you can almost DM anyone and ask them questions and they're they're more than comfortable with with helping, which is kind of crazy to think. Um, and that, beautiful. Like the, yeah, it's it's it, yeah, I mean it's, it's it's beautiful. I mean, that's how that's how this account started, right? Like I was posting and somebody was like, here, here's a boost. And all of a sudden it became thousands of followers. And now the the amount of information I I read on a daily basis just from X and like the Slack community I created and LinkedIn has, has been incredible. Absolutely. Nicole, you moved from agency side into working at a company like Paramount. What made you do that move? And and how did the, I guess, agency side of your work help you in your role doing partnerships and emerging, you know, media revenue at Paramount? How did that all help you? So in my last role on the agency side, I was running digital for PepsiCo, which is just a wonderful account to constantly learn on, or was at the time. And we were working closely with X, previously Twitter, uh, Snapchat, and you know what it's grown to become, Meta, and, and what it now is, and Musical.ly, now TikTok. We got to be close to these partners as they grew. You know what they've become in a decade is phenomenal, and you know we used to have to prove these platforms out. And so, you know, we really got to have a seat at the table in working with these partners and these leaders at these platforms. And so I learned a lot while I was working on the PepsiCo account and working with these platforms. And that is something that on the publisher side, you know, the publishers really wanted to learn how to do. So how could the publishers work with their, you know, consumer audiences? So such as an MTV. So MTV also wants to reach consumer audiences, but they also wanted to generate revenue from these platforms. So it was really taking what I'd learned from my agency days and applying it over to the Viacom properties and now Paramount properties. So how can we work with our platform partners, such as the Twitters and the Facebooks and the Snapchats and the now TikToks to reach consumer audiences, but also generate advertising revenue off of it. So we were working with those platforms at the time to create new products, such as conversational AI, which is the hot topic now, and generate revenue off of it. So it was really just applying what we learned for the brands on the advertising side to the publisher side and continuing to generate advertising revenue off of it. Do you think that there's a little bit of a a, a disconnect, and this wasn't on the agenda, but do you feel like there's a little bit of a disconnect between 
what publishers want, what advertisers want, and, and maybe what ad tech is wants or is capable of doing? I think it depends on the publisher. I think that there are some publishers and brands that truly come from a place of wanting to reach their consumer and, you know, speak to their consumer on their terms. And then advertising is brought in to generate revenue to make sure that publisher can continue to exist. And so it really is like a cohesive environment where everyone is working together. And, you know, there's battles from the tech side where it's like, please put the ad tag back on, you know? And I think that we've all seen that Steve Jobs video where when you're butting heads, you have the best kind of product, you know, the smooth stone reference. And those kind of groups are the best, where the best product comes out, right? So you have your brand who wants to reach your consumer, you have your advertising and tech teams that want to put your ad tags on, and we all want to generate revenue. So at the end of the day, everything comes out and is great for the consumer, and it's great for the advertiser, and we're hitting our business goals. And there are some publishers that are like that, and they're great, and they're great to work at, and that's why we stay there for five years, you know? And then there are publishers that are not like that, right? They're just there to generate revenue, hit business goals, and, and they're not really thinking about the consumer at the end of the day. So the publishers that put the consumer first and the audience first, and then they understand right that there are business goals and sometimes advertising goals in there, and they work within the, you know, the tech confines to make their consumer experience better. Like Those are great publishers and great places to be. It's funny because you can see you can you can visibly see which publishers care and which ones don't. I'm, I'm not really here to point fingers, but you know I've been to a few websites that I would say more web than anything connected TV. Not really applicable, but I've been through quite a few websites where I look and I go, "This is just horrendous. Like this is such a bad experience. Like thanks for the article, but this is too much." And everyone, you know, that I don't want to say the MFA word <laughs> or acronym. But not every publisher is an MFA. You know, some use advertising to help support their business model, but that doesn't mean that they're not considerate of their consumer. Yeah, I think I think the MFA topic is, is super interesting because it's been happening so long, but now there's there's a label to it. And I think it's really important to just maintain the integrity of our true journalists and content that's written with good quality and that's where our ads should serve and not on the ones where you're you're bombarded with all types of videos and display ad units and interstitials and it's just a horrendous user experience like that's not where the money should go and i'm, I'm really happy that the industry overall has taken the initiative to kind of point this out and, and make a correction i mean let's let's spend money where 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 the journalists deserve to make a good income and get highlighted for their content and not for kind of junky sites with ads everywhere. In your career, you've, you've obviously worked across a multitude of roles, but what do you feel like in, in your view is, is the biggest highlight or milestone that you're proud of having moved into your own business today? There have been throughout my career, just so many things I've enjoyed doing in every role I've done, but what I can say in my current role is that I love getting to say no <laughs> and um, choosing whom I want to work with and, and what I believe in and the brands and companies and the tech that I want to work with. So I think that's a true milestone in your career is, is the ability to say no, which is just the best. I like that too. I think there are things that I'm asked to do in terms of, you know, promotions or products and even sponsors for Slack and where I'm just like, no, I'm not interested. But I, I do like that. I don't think I'm at the point where I can turn down a lot of business, but I'm I'm definitely at this comfortable spot where where I can be selected with the right partners and the right people to work with. Now I'm also kind of moving into more of a, you know, who are the strategic partners I need to work with long term? over who's kind of like the tactical partners I need to work with short term. But with the podcast and, and all of my awesome, you know, pre-roll ads and mid-roll ads, which don't forget to listen to those today. I love it. I think it's created such a great opportunity for me and for my future. 
Yes. And and for all the people that you're helping. That's the goal. You know, it was it was fun. It was a little bit of shit posting, to be honest with you. Um, in the beginning, more out of fun. But I think I've said it before. When I realized I need to work in this industry again, I pulled it back a little. And I figured, why add to the mess? Like, why add to the stress? And why add to the challenges that we're having in our industry? Why not promote it? Why not speak well of it? Address the issues, but, you know, push things forward and, and you know, help educate people so that they become better at what they do every day. What do you think has been the biggest challenge? I mean, obviously, as an entrepreneur, there's, there comes with some challenges. Do you feel like starting an RF was a challenge for you or did you just kind of fall into starting your own company or how did you even get into it? Well, I did try to start a different company because I really do like shoes and clothes and and all these things. And I thought because I was such a great marketer, <laughs> I could just do an e-commerce um, site and I would be great at that. And you know what? That's not as easy as people make it sound when you see Instagram ads about people starting Shopify sites. But for quite a while, I've been advising companies. You know, I think a lot of us in the industry get asked to be on advisory boards. We get called and we do it willingly. We'll help out friends that are starting businesses or acquaintances of friends who are starting businesses. And many of us are on the, you know, the GLGs or the IV execs advisories. And so, you know, I've been doing that for about 10 years now. And I realized if I'm doing these things and I'm helping small businesses in my community and friends of family, you know, why can I not do this as a business? So it really kind of started in that way as, you know, this really is what I'm good at and I'm passionate about crazily enough. I love shoes and clothes and e-commerce, but what I really know and I go to sleep thinking about <laughs> crazy enough is advertising. <laughs> and who would have thunk that when I was, you know, a six-year-old child that I would be going to sleep at night thinking about advertising. So it really stemmed out of this is what I just do naturally every single day. This is what people call me and ask me to do. You know, it's a friend of the family. They're starting a new company and they need help. You know, they're always calling and asking me. And so that's really where it started. And then I would say the challenges are, I think, the same challenges every entrepreneur has, which is finding the right partners, like you said, long term partners. You know, you'll work with a tech startup. For example, I worked with one tech startup and they're building a new CTV product. They're launching it in 2025. They're in stealth mode. They're working on their patent. And, you know, I'm working with them on their sales enablement process and their product marketing commercialization. And a friend says, Hey, why don't you meet with this startup? They need X help on Y. And I do that and I realize that. They have the same product, except one has the patent and one doesn't. So sometimes you meet with a company and you're helping them and they may be paying you, but one of the companies might be a little bit of hot air and one of the companies isn't. And I think we all, as entrepreneurs and meeting with companies and ad tech startups in general, great ideas. A lot of people have great ideas, but there's not always funding. There's not always the brick and mortar that goes into the idea. So those are some of the hurdles and challenges I think we all face when working in general. But the good thing about this is when you see there's a little hot wind in some of your partners that you're working with, you can always walk away versus being in a full-time job with some of these companies. Well, I think it's especially in, in not to be a you know negative, but, but especially in at tech, like sometimes you feel like, okay, I'm, I'm hearing the same pitch from three or four different partners, or I've spoken to three or four different partners that do very similar things. Like which one is actually the one that works? Like which one is the, uh, the one that has proprietary data or proprietary solutions and market? And which one is just sort of using what exists and, and repackaging it and repositioning it? It's hard. It's hard to tell the difference. Yeah, I think when you talk to a company for long enough, 
the first time they pitch, you can believe what they say. But when you talk to a company long enough, and I've been doing this long enough that you start asking the questions and eventually they, you get to the bottom of it. And the glorious thing about advising and consulting is that you can just walk away from it. Um, you're not forced into repackaging the trade desk as proprietary. What's, what's the joke is that all the GSPs are built on beeswax. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm like, okay, like I, I look, and I'm like, just type in, you know, company name dot beeswax.com. I'm like, oh, okay. So it's built on beeswax, which is great. Like obviously a fantastic company that was acquired and, you know, Ari obviously made out and, and so did his partners. And, and that was a great move, right? Overall, but it's like, has anyone really innovated all that much in the DSP space? And everyone is selling Netflix inventory on CTV. I'm like, they don't, do they have that much inventory that everyone is selling it? Really? <laughs> that's the thing. And I think that's the, the scary part is that I think we've gotten comfortable. And I had this conversation with Joe Zawatsky on his podcast where it's like, okay, it's, it's time. It's time to kind of break the mold. It's time to innovate a little bit. It's time to create new products and solutions and market. And I think connected TV is, is really what is going to cause that because it is so new. People are, are chasing, you know, the growth and the revenue. And they know that it is going to be a median that stays for a very long time. It's not just a fad. And so, you know, they're coming up with some really good solutions, but it's also hard to, to know which one is the right one. Yes. What do you think in general for the industry overall? It could be at, at tech or advertising. What trend do you think really has tailwinds behind it? I'm actually intrigued to see what happens with digital out of home. I know everyone's chasing the rainbow with CTV, but there's only so much CTV inventory and content and premium content. And and I know everyone's saying AI and AI is a buzzword, but digital out of home has been hard to scale and monetize. It's been kind of put in a bucket because there hasn't been the ability to create all of the different ad units necessary. It's kind of been put in the bucket with out of home. And so I'm kind of interested to see what happens with it now because you can do so many different creative variations with AI. And we're starting to see more pipes being built to automate digital out of home in terms of trafficking ads. So I'm intrigued to see what happens with digital out of home because when everyone's focusing on CTV and, and everyone's going to have a space race for CTV inventory because so much revenue is there, I feel like if there's some people that are, you know, just focusing on digital out of home and put their eggs in that basket, I think that there's a lot of opportunity there. You know, I don't see any CTV ads. They're, I'm premium all the way. The only ads I ever see are digital out of home ads. I'm, I'm in the middle of nowhere. So if you're going to serve me an ad, it's going to be on the New York Times mobile when I open my Wordle, or if you can get me out of my house. So I find that to be a really open space that maybe isn't being commoditized in the way that it should. You know, it only took us 40 episodes for someone to say digital out of home, which is Try pretty incredible. Every, you know, no. <laughs> I'm, look, I'm with you. I mean, look, I follow a lot of the, the digital out of home companies and if you want to call them influencers or, or contributors, you know, on LinkedIn and X and, and elsewhere, I'm seeing a lot. I'm hearing a lot. I just, I don't know enough about it to really speak to it in detail outside of, I know the targeting capabilities are getting much stronger. I obviously run digital out of home campaigns for the podcast. So I do it for New York and I did it in Palm Desert. I did it in Miami and it works. Like we have the data, right? I have the data of who scanned the QR code. I have the data of, you know, the lat long and what billboard or, or sign it was on. It's pretty cool, especially for, for what I was trying to achieve, which is really just branding. And when is the last time you saw anyone screenshot a CTV ad or a ad on their computer and post it on X or LinkedIn? But I've seen a lot of out of home ads get screenshot. You know, the British Airways, that was out of home, not digital out of home. I saw your you know, taxi cab ads get screenshot. You see the Volta ads get screenshot. So people are seeing those ads, they're engaging with them and, you know, they're resonating with them. And everyone else is complaining, where are the great ads? Where are all the great ads? I see people resonating with out of home and digital out of home ads. So, you know, I think there's a big opportunity there. And if people 
put some time and attention there, I, I think it would provide a lot of value. So you obviously like shopping, Nicole, um, and you like <laughs> shoes. So I wanted to ask you, um, you know, what brand has your loyalty? What brand do you love and what brand and, and really why? Like, why do you love the brand and why do you feel like it has your loyalty? I'm going to shout out to a brand that I'm loving right now and I'm working with. It's called Igloo Outfitters. It's getting warm, so I don't know if it counts, but it's a female founded brand and I am a sports mom. So there is a big windy day out here in Colorado and it's basically a sleeping sack <laughs> and it it's for moms who go to games and are freezing cold and you put it on your body and um, it keeps you warm for the whole game when you're sitting at your son's baseball game or your daughter's lacrosse game for hours. And it's well-made. It's owned by uh, three sisters I love them because they send emails and it's personalized and they take product feedback. And so I think any brand that is solving a challenge for their customers, listens to customer feedback, updates their product based on customer feedback, has my loyalty. So there's multiple brands like that, you know, REI. Patagonia, those are brands like that. Of course, I like some Zhuzhi brands, but I think that's a great example of a brand that I love that I've purchased from most recently. Jones Road, that's another example. These are brands that are just listening to their customers. They're kind of doing DTC marketing, I would say. And they're really taking customer feedback, iterating their marketing based on customer feedback. And those are brands that I'm just loving right now. And it's because of those reasons. There's a couple brands that I love. I don't, I'm not going to say, but there's, there's a particular clothing brand that I wear almost every single day. Same. I think they changed the design of their shirt at one point and I was pissed. Uh, and I emailed them. I told them you guys ruined it. Like you ruined your cut. You need to go back. And apparently they received thousands of complaints and they came back and brought it back to the store which I was pretty impressed by that they actually address it. And they're not small, like they're a big company. And they came back and they said, look, we're bringing it back. Meanwhile, you have other brands that push their products and like, you have to like it because we made it. Yeah, it's like, no, I like to wear the same shirt every single day. Like I have a whole drawer full of them. So why would I ever switch it up? Like, don't switch it up on me. I like it. I'm comfortable. I wear jeans and a t-shirt every day of my life. Like I, I'm not really looking to, to change it up right now. And there's a learning for everyone in that product feedback for all products that you're pushing. Exactly. And how do you, as an entrepreneur, you obviously deal with a lot of you know pressure sometimes and there's stress sometimes and there's urgency, but how do you keep the temperature on, on your happiness and, and making sure that you feel content and that you're delivering value for yourself as well as for your clients? Truly, I, I think we talked about this before. It's how I'm sleeping at night and how I'm waking up in the morning. You know, I've gotten a lot better at saying no. And I think as an entrepreneur, you, you can do that or you can allow yourself to do that. I think I've learned that with my last job in corporate and being able to do this is, you know, saying no. If I'm stressing out when I'm going to bed, I know that I need to say no. And if I'm not waking up energized and happy to start my day, something's off and I need to fix it. And so my temperature check is, am I tuned in with my kids when they come home from school and they're going to sports? The worst feedback I ever got from my son was his interpretation of me was he put his hand up and he said, hold on, I need to check my email. And that was his interpretation of me as a mother. And I got that feedback and it broke my heart. And so, you know, that's not his feedback of me anymore. So my, I'm checked in as a mother with my kids when they're with me. I sleep well at night and I'm energized to do my job in the morning. And that is truly makes me a better person for the people I'm working with and makes me better at my job. And it makes me a better human overall to everyone I'm around. And, you know, I've gotten that feedback from everyone I'm around. So how I'm sleeping, how I'm checked in with my family, and if I'm wake up energized to answer those emails and talk to the people and do the job that I'm doing. You know, it's funny you say that. I, I had similar from my kids. I had them one time say, I said, look, it's, it's time 
it's enough. Like put away the devices. Let's go hang out. And the response was, why? You're always on Twitter. <laughs> Gotta bring the phone to the bathroom to do that. So the kids and I was you. like, Oh God, this is becoming a problem. So even me, I've, I've, I've disconnected in the evening time. Now I put my phone away from, you know, six to like eight thirty, nine 9 o'clock at night until they go to bed. I try to stay connected with them. I think I was on this like real tear of like growing audience and like getting the reach I wanted because I started to see the potential. But then I realized like I was always on Twitter, always on my email, always saying, hold on, let me check my schedule. Even if they're like, can you, can you chaperone us for a field trip? I'm like, let me check my schedule. It's like, no, I can. Like, I'm not working for anyone. Like, I'm doing this full time. Like, I have the right to cancel and go and spend two hours with my kid so that they're happy. I really love that you did that and you noticed it as well. Yeah. Our time with our family and other people is absolutely the most precious commodity that we have. I agree. I agree. Well, Nicole, that actually brings us to the end of this podcast. So I, I really wanted to thank you for being here and, and thank you for the trust and, and thank you for all your input today. And thank you for everything you've done for all of us. Of course. Anytime. Thank you, Nicole. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Ad Tech God Pod, a podcast for the people about the people that make Ad Tech great. Stay connected with me for more insights, trends, and interviews in the realm of ad tech. Don't miss out on our latest updates. So follow me on X, Instagram, and connect with me on LinkedIn. Don't forget, ATG Slack community has insights, networking opportunities, and jobs. Keep the conversation going and stay at the forefront of ad tech innovation.